No, thank you, Mark. Thanks for organizing this meeting. Thanks for inviting us and so on. So I have to begin with a confession. Uh, I don't know how wise the crowd is. That's my confession. Um, <clears throat> but when I looked at all the titles, I saw everyone had the wisdom of the crowd. So I just wondered, how wise is it? So that's why it's in the title. Um, also, the, the co-author should not be held responsible for some of the more outrageous things I will say at the beginning of the talk. They can, however, be held responsible for the actual work that I talk about afterwards, uh, after the outrageous things. So this talk's divided into three parts, preliminaries, where I get a lot of uh, um, things I've been thinking about off my chest, and then talk about two different studies, these done with the various co-authors that are listed, uh, forecast aggregation uh, via calibration, and um, an approach to evaluating forecasts through uh, the signal detection theory kind of notion area under the curve. So first I want to make a distinction between discrete and, and continuous variables. And uh, I mean, the distinction is obvious, of course, and it's not a clear distinction because continuous variables can, can be discretized. But the re oh, only reason I'm making this distinction is most of the work is done at the discrete level. And um, the work on continuous variables, we saw this yesterday, for, for the most part focuses on aggregating point estimates of what a continuous variable will be. And I'd like to suggest um, we should really be working on the entire distributions. Now, I don't have a lot to say about that right now. I know that Bob's going to say something about it this afternoon because he, he and I talked about it. Um, certainly, there has been some work on formal aggregation of full distributions, but I think it would be really useful. And my recent interests have turned in that direction. So if there's another meeting of this sort, I hope I'll have something to say about that the next time. But the focus today is on aggregating probability distributions about discrete, actually about binary events in this case. Um, another distinction I want to make is between aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. And it's always amazed me that these two groups that couldn't be thought to be any different, engineers who are very practical and philosophers whose heads are entirely immersed in the clouds, they use these two terms, aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. And behavioral scientists who, who ought to be using these terms, in my opinion, tend not to. Um, aleatory uncertainty is uh, associated with exchangeable events in De Finetti's sense. It's, in some sense, um, irreducible uncertainty. Uh, epistemic uncertainty is uncertainty associated with lack of knowledge about unique events, past events or future events, but they're unique. And I think a lot, most of the much of the forecasting literature, at least um, a lot of the really interesting issues arrive from wanting to forecast unique events. Um, will Assad fall from power within the next six months? Um, will North Korea launch an attack on South Korea? What have you. So I, I don't think this is a firm distinction. There's, there are really two ends of continuum, I believe. Uh, I suspect many in this room think the distinction is immaterial, uh, but I, I find it, uh, including Bob, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, I, know, I know, we've discussed this so many times. Um, but I, I think it's a useful distinction to keep in mind. And, uh, and it's probably the one important aspect of it is, is that it tends to be related with this notion of uh, dependence in information sources which is very important in, aggreg in, in aggregation, as we discussed yesterday. So what are the goals of aggregating probabilistic forecasts? Well, one goal, of course, is to improve calibration. And this is the one that most people talk about. Another goal is to improve diagnosticity. Uh, the third goal is to minimize the Breyer score, or some other strictly proper scoring rule score. And the Breyer score combines both is kind of a, is a combination of both calibration and diagnosticity, and also uh, problem difficulty, as Alan Murphy showed so many years ago. Then a paper, relatively recent paper, I think it should be 2010, not 2012. Um, Ranjana and Knighting said the goal of probability in probability forecasting is to maximize the sharpness of the forecast distributions subject to calibration. So that's the kind of saying they're both important, but one is more important than the other. So. My argument is that when we're talking about unique events and, and the uncertainty is really uh, due to lack of knowledge, then we would like to improve diagnosticity. Uh, in aleatory cases, um, diagnostic 
there's a limit to how diagnostic one can be, and the primary goal there probably is to improve calibration. Uh, <coughs> and and uh, there can be conditionally independent evidence in aleatory cases. Think of a situation where you have uh, an urn with balls that are, say, either red or blue, and they're either orthogonally, they're either striped or not. Some people know the colors, others know whether stripes appeared or not, so that those can be conditionally independent sources of information, and they can be combined and improve the diagnostic value and improve the calibration, but still, you're not going to get past the irreducible uncertainty that's associated with it. Uh, in epistemic cases, and for example, in the intelligence analysis context or in medical diagnosis or a host of other problems, um, <coughs> the events are Oftentimes, the uncertainty is much more associated with lack of knowledge. And so, so there's an interesting result that uh, Adila Diederich and I proved in 2001, and Gnei and Shervich had a different approach to it. But the basic uh, theorem with different auxiliary assumptions associated with it is that asymptotically, assuming at least weak signals in the forecast, conditional independence, pairwise independence even, uh, guarantees perfect diagnosticity. So um, as you aggregate the judgments of more and more conditionally independent, probabilistic forecasts of more and more conditionally independent judges, you can achieve perfect diagnosticity, assuming most of them know at least a little something or another. So I used to call it a Rumpelstiltskin theorem. Uh, so that's a, we have an asymptotic result, but the asymptote is reached very, very quickly in ideal cases. And even when conditional independence is violated, uh, the combinations can still improve substantially. So here's, um, here's a, a uh, comparison. This is a situation where the uncertainty is, is aleatory, and individuals saw different samples, and they gave their estimates, and compared to the relative frequency, this was the calibration, this is the average calibration curve people tend to be somewhat um, underconfident. Is that right? No, overconfident in this case. I never, I always get these things mixed up. Uh, yeah, overconfident, they give estimates that are too extreme. When the event is unlikely, they give estimates that are too unlikely, vice versa. Average their judgments and it comes much closer. So this is the average calibration curve. This is the calibration curve of the average judgments. It comes much closer to being um, well calibrated. This is a case with unique events. Uh, individuals were giving their probability estimates that certain um, statements were either true or false. And in fact, they were either true or false. So this is the average calibration curve. This is the calibration curve of the average judgments. And you see how much more diagnostic it is. It becomes less calibrated and more diagnostic. And that's a feature. Of, of this distinction depending on the, the um, sources of the dependence among the observations. Here's a, a graph from a paper with Tim Johnson, David Badescu, and myself in which we did um, Monte Carlo runs where we systematically violated the uh, conditional independence assumption, pair, conditional pairwise independence assumption from being perfectly um, holding here to pairwise correlation of 0.6 here, calibration curves for one judge, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. And you see that it tends to work very well, but in particular what I want to show you is in this case where the assumption is perfectly met, uh, this particular situation, the average of the judgments becomes almost perfectly diagnostic, somewhere it's between 8 and 16 judges. So it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of judges. Uh, evaluation criteria. So the um, IARPA ACES program, which many of you know about this, I'll say a little bit more about it for this is so the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity uh, ended up holding a, um, putting out a um, call for proposals and they finally awarded um, contracts to five different teams. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But among the criteria was to develop methods for um, eliciting and aggregating probabilistic judgments about future events uh, and, and to, to, to beat the um, 
Breyer score. They don't call it the Breyer score in there because because they don't want to tell Congress how much money they spent to minimize BS <laughs> in, <laughs> in forecasts. So they have an, they have another term for it, but mean proportional error, if I remember right, something like the MPE. Um, <clears throat> Any case, so we had to beat the Breyer score of, a, of an unweighted linear pool by a certain amount in year one, by a certain amount in year two, and so on. And it fairly quickly became obvious to, to those of us on our team that um, the Breyer score was, was the criterion we were forced to use, but it wasn't necessarily the best criterion to use. And again, I'll just point out, I, this is the same quote I had before, and I still have the wrong year in there. It's 2010, it's not 2012. Um, <clears throat> this at least gives more weight to one goal than the other, and the Breyer score doesn't, doesn't really do that. Uh, and uh, Ed Merkel and Mark uh, recently um, showed that uh, using a whole family of scoring rules that the uh, relative performance of different judges or different aggregation uh, um, models and so on the relative performance can change a lot depending on which scoring rules you use, and they're all strictly proper scoring rules that they focused on. So one, one movement in that direction is, is work by, by uh, Bob and his colleagues to develop an approach that allows the scoring rule to be tailored to the problem and to the decision maker's needs or utilities and so on. So I think that's a step in the right direction, so Bob, I do congratulate you for that. Uh, but an alternative approach is area under the curve. So uh, maximizing the diagnostic value of forecasts is, is, is really the same as maximizing the decision maker's ability to discriminate future event occurrences from non-occurrences. Um, and in other words, maximize the probability that a forecaster assigns a higher probability to an event that will occur to an event that will not occur. And this is really the kind of issue when, when um, signal detection theory knows a lot about how to analyze that kind of a situation. And from that perspective, Calibration, per se, really becomes much less important. In an earlier version of these slides, I said calibration becomes unimportant, but uh, one of the co-authors there convinced me I was a little too strong in that. But certainly becomes less important. And what I'm going to argue at, at the end of the talk is that the decision maker, if you can get ROC functions for given forecasting domains, then the decision maker can really estimate hit and false alarm rates, hit and false alarm rates associated with any given decision criterion, and that's really what they need to know in making their decisions. I'll come back to that argument. So now I've gotten a lot of things off my chest, and I'm going to start talking about research. <laughs> um, any comments or questions at this point? Okay. It's all not surprising. What's that? It's all not surprising. <laughs> because you know me or for other reasons? Because I was here yesterday. So, uh, so, so this study, is, um, it's under revision in machine learning. I'd say it's probably about 97.5% accepted at this point <laughs> and done with Brandon Turner, Mark Stivers, Ed Merkel, and, and David Budescu. And we did this in the context of this IARPA ACE program that I mentioned where um, the focus was to find the best ways to combine probability forecasts in the presence of systematic distortions. So we developed models to aggregate and recalibrate probability forecasts to minimize BS. So these are the types of questions that uh, people were asked. Um, what is the probability or how certain are you that North Korea will attempt to launch a multi-stage rocket between 7 January 2013 and 1 September 2013? You can read the other questions there. The point is the questions are very concerned very well-defined events and they have very clear um, ending dates. So, so, so these are not imprecise events. They are events for which one can eventually determine whether or not they occurred, and then the probability forecast can be scored. So this, I mentioned a few of these points already. Uh, IARPA awarded contracts to five teams. Uh, we're just at the end of year two, and one team remains standing. Um, the other four teams have gone down in flames, including ours. But um, we did very well at the end of year one. We were ex extremely proud of ourselves. And we didn't do well at all in year two. Uh, fortunately, a number of us will be joining the, the one team that's still standing. So we're looking forward to another year's worth of work on this project. 
So each team assembled their own set of experts and they did all their own work, developed their elicitation methods, aggregation methods, and so on. Every day we had to submit aggregated forecasts to, um, to MITRE, which was operating as the, um, there's a certain term for this, but as the uh, unbiased agent for IARPA. And then we were scored uh, annually based on our performance. And we were scored against a neutral sixth team run by MITRE. Um, they collected the forecast from their team in what they thought was as neutral a manner as possible. And then they simply took the unweighted average. And that's called the unweighted linear opinion pool, or the ULINOP is the term that ended up rolling off of our tongues. So this was what our website looked like. And volunteers from around the country um, actually around the world, but we were only allowed to use the U.S. Uh, judgments, could, could log on whenever they wanted, and they could, could answer questions, and they could go back and revise their judgments and so on. Uh, the data for this study are from, from early in the, in the process, 160 binary questions. Uh, how confident are you that event X will happen by date Z? Uh, there were some 1,300 people in, in, in this data set. But everyone shows which questions to answer. Some people answered a lot, some answered a few, some revised, most didn't. And on average, each user contributed to a median of five questions out of these 160. Uh, for these particular 160 questions, 19% um, of the time, the event that was asked about actually happened. So, so the base rate of event occurrence in this sample of questions was 0.19. The average probability given by users was 0.36. So it's global overconfidence. Uh, but I was struck by the, the nature of the calibration curves that we had and all the other teams had. And, and so this is from this set of data. So this is the average calibration curve for individuals. This is the calibration of the uh, average judgments. And if you, I put this back in here, compare, this is the average calibration curve of individuals here, which very much, re, reflects what is found in the literature, very different from this, yet this is what all the teams tended to get. So uh, it, w it was very humbling to see this, I have to say, that um, kind of these generalizations we took from the lab to this research just don't seem to hold here. And I don't really know why, but I think it's an interesting question. So um, the recalibration function, or the calibration function we used, is shown up here. And the uh, delta parameter uh, influences the, the um, sorry, this is holding delta fixed. So the gamma parameter influences the curve. It's, this is a particular value of delta. As you vary gamma, it influences the curvature. And when you vary delta, it influences where it cuts the diagonal. So it's a very flexible uh, calibration curve. And this was the one that, that we used. And so this talk just compares two classes of models, um, average the judgments, and then recalibrate the average. And this is what a typical recalibration curve looks like with confidence bounds on it. Um, it's kind of similar to the empirical one I showed you earlier, but this is, this is output from the model. Um, well, that just shows it's re not calibrated. Uh, the alternative is to have the individual judgments recalibrate each individual judgment and then average in log odds the recalibrated judgments. And so this is recalibrating each individual. This graph shows that this is from a hierarchical uh, Bayesian model, that judges can be very, very different in their calibration curves. Um, <coughs> generally speaking, I would say, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong here, the more questions a, a participant answers, the narrower will the confidence bounds be in general. Um, but see, there's lots of individual differences. And, and, and as here I got the date right, I want to point out. Um, so the average of individually calibrated judgments is not calibrated as, as you know, they proved must be the case. That's the only point here. And uh, it's true when you plot it in log odds as well. It's just a little bit easier to see that. And this is the Breyer score mean prediction error. That's what they call it, MPE instead of BS. So we were paid to minimize MPE. <laughs> um, it's a proper scoring rule. 
So this is the Breyer score. I think everyone in the room probably knows what the Breyer score is. So here are some results. Uh, so this is the um, mean Breyer score, uh, me mean of the daily Breyer scores, actually. And then uh, all these percent improvements are relative to that base rate here. And we see that calibrate than average does better than average than calibrate. If you take into account individual differences, you can get better yet. And so we were really pleased with these results, you know, some year ago or so. Uh, individual forecasters were just terrible. They would have been better off to guess. <coughs> this is surprising to me. Um, because of the Ranjan and Knighting result that says if you have well calibrated experts, you average, you're going to have the underconfident forecast. Yeah, but you're still going to be diagnostic. And That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're improving the diagnosticity, but not. And one could recalibrate the results, too, and improve that. Uh, I, we didn't do that, did we, Mark? I don't recall that we did. No. Uh, That's David. what I was going to ask. You could calibrate again after you. Yeah, sure. Um, now, uh, something I, I just glided over, that recalibration function does not lead to additive probabilities. In any case, though, that's an interesting point. But um, one can renormalize, too, but then I get, you get rid of some of the advantage of having the recalibration. There are a lot of really sticky um, issues in there. <coughs> so uh, reconsidered. So the calibrate and average with individual differences model that did so well in year one did poorly in year two. I've already said that to you. Um, and and we, we've learned that this was because the events, the model was not tuned to events that, no, sorry, the model was tuned to events that re resolved within a relatively short time frame. In year one, uh, IARPA gave us all these problems with short time frames because they had to get some results to begin to actually uh, evaluate to, as um, the pro program manager said, to, to brief his mother every now and then on what was happening with the program. <laughs> And so, so it was tuned to fairly um, short time frame events. As we moved into year two, uh, longer events with longer time frames began to mature, and, and the model just wasn't tuned to them. And so that's a really important point that needs to be, uh, closing date needs to be incorporated in future work. This is an example of, uh, you see here, the uh, estimates given a day before the event closed were very well calibrated. Event, estimates given 100 days before the event closed were very poorly calibrated in that direction. You can see the change. Uh, this is a curve. Uh, two, two other people, well, Dirk Warner from ARA was the um, PI in this project. He assembled a team of lots of academics. Yang Wan Shin worked with him. And towards the end, when they were realizing what was happening, and Dirk and Yang Wan and David and I got together and we talked, were talking about this and, and looked at, thought this might be a systematic way to look at what happens to the calibration curve. So you can think of a, a window, a 30, roughly 30-day 30 window, and you slide it along. So you get um, all the problems that are centered around 16 days, all the forecasts that are centered around 16 days from the closing date, 17 days from the closing date, and so on and so on and so on. And this is an example of the, uh, the different calibration curves. And, and what I want, all I wanted to really show from this is that if one then fits that two-parameter model that I showed you earlier, uh, the parameters begin to converge with time. So I do think there can be systematic ways to include the closing time in, into this model. So it's not necessarily that the, the um, particular calibration equation is wrong, but we didn't, we didn't tune it to, to time from uh, event. And I think that's going to be important going forward. Um, now I'm going to turn to the other study. How am I doing on time, Mark? You have lots of time. Oh, lots of time. Good. Well, uh, I have another slide deck as well, if, if necessary. Uh, so I know. So this is another study uh, going beyond Breyer scores. It, uh, this is the, the um, area study in which we developed these uh, AUC models, and it's, it's under review right now. Um, so these Bayesian signal detection model to measure area under the curve diagnosticity and distinguish that from bias uh, over under global over under confidence. So um, the standard way to measure area under the curve, one can do empirical um, ROC analyses and it's very simple and, and it's done in psychophysical studies, it's done in a lot of medical diagnostic studies, extremely, extremely common. You, you, ha you show people um, stimuli of one sort or another, they either contain a signal or they don't or in a, judgment case, either the event 
uh, is true or it's false, say if we're talking about real world knowledge or something of that sort, or maybe the, the, the x-ray either is a cancerous tumor or it's a benign cyst, whatever. In each case, there's, it's the, in the simplest case, there's a stimulus that either it contains a signal or it doesn't. The person either says yes or no, or maybe they give a confidence estimate, what have you. And eventually you can collect all the judgments associated with true signals and all the judgments of, and look at the distribution. Well, there's a th hypothetical, a theoretical distribution of um, inputs, decision variable, perception, whatever. And then there's associated with all those events that were signals. There's another one associated with all those events that were non-signals. You get two overlapping distributions. And as you run a threshold across, you can trace out the ROC curve. Well, that's fine if you have enough data. But in this judgment case, uh, we had a, a big problem was sparse data. Some subjects, uh, some of our respondents answered one or two problems, maybe other to answer 10. As I said earlier on, I average they answered about five. Uh, so you need a way to handle the data sparsity. And we wanted uh, a method that would apply to both individual and aggregated forecasts. And um, this, I think this leads to a natural way to express uncertainty in terms of area under the curve, which I'm going to argue is the hit and false alarm rates. Uh, so here is an, an empirical, an example of an empirical um, building of an ROC curve. One could take uh, all the, the forecasts, this is just made up, one could take all the forecasts, rank order them from the lowest confidence to the highest confidence that the event will occur. These are different events, different forecasts. And then we have the outcome variable, zero, the event did not occur, just illustrating that with the ends. One, the event did occur. And you can begin to move your threshold up and trace the ROC curve from down here. And if you follow this through, so here I'll put your threshold really low and your hit rate is one because you call everything an, a signal and your false alarm rate is one because you call everything a signal. And as you move the threshold along, uh, eventually you stop calling everything a signal and finally, oops, you just uh, had a miss here so your hit rate goes down. And you can trace out the uh, a, the area under the curve that way empirically, and it's, this example is 0.91. But it's not, it's not very, um, for one thing, it's not very pretty, but for another thing, it's just very, very imprecise. So an alternative way is to fit distributions to the judgments. You can collect all, all the probability judgments for uh, um, situations where the event finally occurred, and you can collect all those for the, where the event did not curve and fit distributions to those, theoretical distributions, beta distributions. And then you can just kind of drag the threshold across here and integrate and get the area under the curve that way. And so that's, that's what we did. <coughs> Is that clear? Uh, the ideal forecaster, uh, who has not been born yet, uh, has an area under the curve of one and no bias. Um, some people are waiting for this person to appear. <laughs> uh, our actual individuals, uh, this is a, a, the hundred, I don't know, forget how, were these the same subjects as the prior study? Yeah, so 160 subjects and the, here's... 1,300. 1,300 subjects, 160 questions, 1,300 subjects. And this is where they all fell um, in terms of, uh, bias is the difference between their mean judgment and the base rate. And AUC is what I just said. And this is an interesting uh, illustration. These are two people with the same Breyer score, but very different areas under the curve. And it, this, this captures the point that the Breyer score is an unspecified combination of calibration and diagnosticity, as well as problem difficulty, which is common in this case to everyone. So I think that's a, a really interesting pair of points. Um, so these are the, <coughs> Yulin Op is the unweighted linear opinion pool that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the empirical distribution of judgments associated with events that didn't occur and that did occur. Then these are the fitted beta distributions. This is the estimated uh, uh, ROC function. The area under the curve, uh, again, 95% credible intervals is between 0.75 and 0.90. This is where uh, calibrated, in other words, take the average and then calibrate. This is a recency weighted average and then calibrating, and this is if you just guess, and you can see the different areas under the curve that come, come about that way. Uh, you can get the, um, each individual uh, can be identified as well, and here are three different 
judges, uh, this judge was very active, this judge wasn't very active but knew a lot, or anyhow, I shouldn't say that, this judge was not very active but was very opinionated, <laughs> which is not the same as knowing a lot. <laughs> and this judge, uh, could have been me, I don't know, one forecast and said the hell with it. And, but still, because of, the, because of the power gathered from the hierarchical Bayesian methods, one can estimate, um, the, the, apply the wisdom of the crowds and get AUCs for everybody. But you notice how big the um, credible interval is here um, compared with, with others. So uh, this compares a lot of uh, different results. Again, the individuals are shown here. Uh, if one were to just randomly guess uh, from, you know, give, just randomly assign a probability, you would end up with very high bias and not very good area under the curve. We can recalibrate that, we can reduce the bias, we don't make it any more diagnostic. Um, the recalibrated uh, un unweighted linear operator pool, well, okay, that's improved things a lot. Uh, it's recalibrated, the bias has gotten out of the system, um, the area is improved, and then the recency weighted one here, this is very good. Uh, this is just the ULINOP. So, so um, <clears throat> this seems to be a good way to think about uh, aggregating the judgments and so on. Here's another graph. Uh, in, in the um, project, the questions were assigned within uh, five different knowledge domains. Pol politics and policy, business and economy, science and technology, military and security, um, and general stuff that people prefer to read about and then this overall. So the, 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 there's two things to notice in this set of graphs. The first thing to notice is, and, and the x-axis here, is number of days before event resolution. So the first thing to notice, as we sh saw earlier, is that as you get closer to event resolution, diagnosticity improves. Not a surprise, but this, this demonstrates it. The second thing to notice is that the, um, the uh, one, one can, can determine these, these areas under the curve uh, for various, 10 minutes, okay, thanks, for various uh, knowledge domains. Now, defining a knowledge domain is a really big issue and a really big problem, but if one can do that, this case was quite arbitrary, then it would be possible to say, well, this knowledge domain is really hard to forecast. We, here's, here's the diagnostic value of this knowledge domain. Let's put our best analysts on it, or let's not waste any time on it. Or, or, or whatever, so one can, can really do that. I think that's an, an important contribution. Uh, so our model, uh, the, the, this particular model, the recency weighted average, ended up doing much better than the unweighted uh, linear opinion pool. As time got closer, but it didn't do well at all way back. So time has to be included. So here are uh, advantages to the area under the curve approach. First of all, it's insensitive to monotonic transformations of the response scale. If it turns out people can estimate better with verbal judgments uh, than numerical, okay, as long as we all agree on the rank ordering of the verbal terms. It doesn't make any difference. A one to seven scale would do. It doesn't make any difference. So recalibration is not really necessary. Bias in the forecast is easily quantified. That's not really true if one uses verbal scales, but if one with numerical scales, that would be true. Um, if sufficiently well specified, the receiver operating characteristic allows estimation of hit and false alarm rates associated with any given decision threshold defined in the aggregate forecast space. So I would like to argue, I don't know whether my co-authors agree with me on this or not, but if they don't, they will eventually. And that is that uh, if, if you can specify the decision domain sufficiently well, and time has to be included in that, you can tell the decision maker, well, okay, so the aggregated forecast here is, is, is 0.8. Well, the 0.8 doesn't really matter. As Bob would say, it's just a datum. But given that datum, this is the hit, and, and our definition of the domain, this is the probability, uh, the hit rate and the false alarm rate probability. You can combine that with your utilities for the, for the different possible outcomes and decide whether to take action. I would argue that's the more important thing for a decision maker than a recalibrated probability. Uh, so my last slide, future directions to develop principled ways to include event duration and domain in both the recalibration and the uh, area under the curve models. And as I say, my opinion is that in the long run, the area under the curve will, will dominate the recalibration issue. And this is really important and a hard problem. Develop principled ways to independently define forecasting domain. 
Uh, one, another topic for the future is to use hierarchical methods to identify excellent forecasters, and this will be helpful in beginning to understand the cognitive processes, look for other cognitive characteristics that are associated with good forecasting and so on. Uh, and then finally, going back to one of the original things I said, I'd really like to find ways to apply these to, quanti to, to, to distributions, to, to opinions about quantitative variables expressed as subjective probability distributions rather than point estimates. And that is my last slide, so thank you. Can you go back to the slide where you had the, the AUC and the bias measure that um, we're characterizing? This one? Uh, no, but yeah, that one will do. No, one no, the next one. Yeah. I think I asked Mark this before, but either I've forgotten the answer or he didn't give me an answer. <laughs> what what the lines of equal Briar score look like in that space? Mm. <clears throat> I saw Briar score correct. Yeah. I that's an interesting question. We, the one, have, we one, haven't done it yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I wonder if one can draw ISO bias curves. I'm just not sure. For one thing, it's going to depend on the problem difficulty. I mean, I, yeah, ISO Briar scores, ISO BS curves, I think we should call them. <laughs> and, and, and for one thing, I, I'm pretty sure, I, you know, I'm just flying right now. And I could end up in the, you know, against the wall. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you would have to control the forecasting difficulty of the problem. In other words, the base rate of the event. And then maybe you could do it. But that's, that's just a, an immediate reaction to your question. Anything else? David. So uh, in this model, you're using this uh, beta distributions to generate your R. ROC and the AUC, how critical is the beta part of it as, opposed, as compared to other distributors and how sensitive it is to the choice of the distributions? Yeah, I don't think we ever looked into that. Mark can, can answer, but I think we just chose the beta as such a natural distribution in this case and uh, it's so flexible. It's, it's not entirely flexible, I know, but <coughs> do you have a suggestion for an alternative? I don't have a suggestion. I mean, yeah. I know a few alternatives, but yeah. I mean, I actually think there's a better way to do this than we did it. <laughs> Let's see if I can find Yeah, so this curve. So you see these are very different curves because <coughs> every event goes into only one of those two distributions. And I, I personally think we should have an independent way to define, say, for example, one side of the question is the status quo and the other side of the question is the non-status quo. And then um, we finally, one of those occurs and the other one doesn't. I think we should put the probability associated with the one that occurs in the right-hand distribution and its complement in the left-hand distribution. Then we get two symmetric distributions and every uh, event is in both of them. I know we've discussed this, but I don't believe we've done it. And then these distributions would be mirror images of each other. You, for one thing, you can reduce the number of parameters by two, but that's not the crucial thing. I just think it's, it's going to be, um, less sensitive to, to, to which event <coughs> is tagged as the one of importance versus the other one. So, well, One issue with the beta yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that a lot of forecasters, they give exactly <coughs> a probability of zero or exactly a probability of one. Right. And the beta doesn't yeah. handle that naturally, so we have to do edge correction and things like that. So that's not a natural, right. nice feature. But another beta. problem is the beta that occasionally you have beta distributions that are not unimodal. So they are, they're bimodal. And I don't know how, what the implications are if you come across such cases for, that's interesting. for the AUC. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, the AUC would not be happy with that. That's right. Yeah. So the problem that Mark just mentioned with zero and one causing problems is going to cause problem no matter what distributions. Right. An alternative distribution would be um, normal over log odds, but it has the same problem, the zero one problem. So. It, it's possible that there's a different process that can explain why people give an exact probability of one. Yeah. Okay. Why not just use the empirical distribution as the earlier slide? Well, one, w one reason is that then one has to, it's just harder to estimate the area under the curve. You've got to do it in a piecewise fashion. 
back in the early that days. Easier. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do it's with one judgment? A lot of forecasters have, have one judgment. How do you calculate their AUC? I'm asking you that. <laughs> <laughs> what was your answer? It's undefined. Yeah. I mean, back in the early days of signal detection theory, there were all kinds of ways to, to approximate area under the curve based on single points or pairs of points. The, the you know, what do you call it, A, A prime, A double prime. I think we got up to A triple prime. Is that right, Bill? I think it was A triple <laughs> prime was the last one. And these were all approximations uh, piecewise one way or another. And this is just a lot smoother. There's another, there's another answer to that question, too, and that's that... Uh, one reason that models tend to work better than empirical data, models of empirical data work better than the empirical data, is they tend to, to, to integrate out the noise pretty much automatically. So, so, you know, there's so many studies that show models of judges tend to do better than the judges they model. And so, and, and I think probably the reason has to do with taking out some of the randomness from the, from the judgments. So that's another reason. I was wondering about those extreme charges with probability zero or one, uh, whether sense to have a kind of a contamination process or like mixture of models. Yeah. Calling good. it the, the pundit cluster. Like <laughs> you should never ever give a probability of 0, 1, 1 unless you were a pundit or I don't know, crazy person. And, and so I was one way to try and tease things out. It seemed to me that this contamination process is almost like a miracle that kind of help, like I don't know, infusion models and others. Yeah. Uh, which that would make sense here. Yeah. Well, yeah, of, of oftentimes. The automatically handles the, the stuff and you don't need any uh, yeah. extremeness correction. Yeah, oftentimes adding a bit of randomness helps in a, in a variety of ways. Yeah. That's a good point. Did I see another hand up? Maybe we're done. Okay. Thanks again.